Sheena, why are we starting? Well, stand up. Now, Matthew Fitt, who was welcome to Onibri in Scots poetry, invented this wee dance. He took it off uh, the hokey cokey and he made it his own with Scots. It's a good way of introducing Burns to Scots through a fun movement. So are you ready? I'm ready. You ready? He's ready there. Are you ready? Aye. I'm ready. You put your right hand in, you put your right hand out, and out, and out, you shock it a boot. You do the shuggly woogly, you barrel a rune, and that's fit, it's a boot. Bricks, you put your left hand in, you put your left hand out. And out, and out, you shock it a boot. You do the shuggly woogly and you barrel a roon. And that is fit, that's a boot. Break, you put your right foot in, your right foot out. And out, and out, you shock it a boot. You do the shuggly woogly and you barrel a roon. And that's fit, that's a boot. Break, you put your left foot in, your left foot and out, and out, you shock it a boot. You do the shuggly woogly, you barrel a roon, and that is fat, it's a boot. Push you put your hail cell and your hail cell out. And out, and out, you shock it a boot, good shock and do the shuggly woogly and you barrel a roon, and that is fat, it's a boot. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that is how you start a wee poetry reading. Oh, yeah, it is indeed. So we're here the day because Sheena Blackhall, a great poet for the North East, has put together her six favourite poems for Bairns. And this is brought to you by the Betty Boyd family. So thanks for their support. Uh, Sheena. Yes. Where shall we start? Well, I'll tell you where we're starting. Mm -hmm. uh, we are starting at a song poem, Up in the Mornings, No For Me, by Robert Burns. And the reason I picked that was, uh, that's where I got a lot of my Scots fame was my father singing. He was ice singing. His favourite songs were Burns, and he also sang uh, Sir Walter Scott, so some of his stuff and all. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's... I didn't realise so much songs Burns had actually written until I was working there with the Burns Federation. So I'll let you hear it. It's fine and simple for Burns. Some of Burns' poems are a bit tricky mm. with the words, but this is easy and it's about uh, no liking getting up in the morning, which a lot of Burns can relate to. Up in the mornings, no for me, up in the morning early. When all the hills are covered with snow, I'm sure it's winter fairly. God blows the wind face to west, the drift is driving sailly. So loud and shrill, I hear the blast, I'm sure it's winter fairly. The birds are chattering in the thorn, a day they fear but sparely. And long's the next fain to morn, I'm sure it's winter fairly. There you go. Smashing, smashing, smashing. So you said that when you were a bear in your cell, your father would gang about the house singing burns all the time. Mm. Is that where you got your kind of poetic lug? Um, well, there was any music in the family. So there was I singing, my grandmother sang in now, but um, she sang Corn Kisters and body songs <laughs> that she'd heard in her father's parks. Um, she, and, and they used to make up rhymes. I didn't know I liked the rhymes. My auntie Gladys, because my name's Sheena, she used to say, Sheen Peen, pick it out the cat scene. And I used to think, that's a horrible thing to say. I like cats. <laughs> Sheen but I mean, Sheen the picked, scene. yes. Um, but they had lots of things like that. Mm -hmm. Charlie Chatsy milked the cats and Gollicky made the cheese. And we will a white bricks, he flig it away, the bees. They come out with all these wee things. Aye, no, my granny, for me, Alistair Heather is such a blether on that we can all agree. When Alistair Heather starts to blether, we all get up and leave. <laughs> Oh, I can! So you really did that, it must be a Scottish thing. I think so. But doing the little folk, that's Pit it. Doing the little folk. That's so, it. So, um, in terms of your father and that relationship with Burns, talk us a bit more about that. 
Well, he was 13 when he left the school in uh, Dabain, and he was a clever loon, and the headmaster came to his dad and said, I want him to bide on, he could do well. And apparently my grandfather said to him, as teacher is a loon amongst men and a man amongst boys. He didn't think much of it as a profession. So father was just yanked out and had to be a crofter's son until he worked his way up and he was manager of a bus company. Uh -huh. But he took his doing, he, took, he didn't have much faith in the Scottish education system, so he drove us himself and he days off, he took us down to Burns's cottage from where we, and he was struck to death with it. He said, oh, look at that wee bed. That's just like the wee bed I slept in when I was a laddie. And probably it was, because they, they wouldn't have been far removed <laughs> for Burns, because my father was 42 when I was born. Aye. So, um, you know. So I, you drove the family the hail length of the country, all the way through the northeast, didn't they? Of course, I to see Burns, yes. Um, so it was awfully important as a real, uh, a real foundation for your education was the Oh yes, I, I mean, he, he, well, we are through the house. And it was like what visiting a shrine, you can, it was sort of reverence and this is Burns and all the rest of it. Um, and you think Burns still has relevance today? Oh, huge. I mean, uh, is, is, apart from the musical side of it, the Burns Federation, the standard work in getting Scots <coughs> into schools and promoting it out of the place. And they widen it new, and they, they've widened it for the music as well, which is good. But uh, it opens it up to our sorts of birds to be accessible. That's the reason it shows up in the morning. The other end sometimes is the Selkirk Grace. Lovely. Well, it is lovely, but the reason I choose the Selkirk Grace is that uh, I say, why could they not eat the meat? Some who meet and can eat, and they say, oh, were they vegan? <laughs> no. <laughs> did they have an allergy? No. Uh, did they not like the food? No. Why did they not eat the meat? They've no idea. And then finally you say, well, if Burns was alive, I'll, I'll give you a wee story. There was no vegetarians. You either, if, you'd, if you were hungry, you'd eat in a scabby cut. <laughs> so the only reason you wouldn't eat is you were sick. As you were so poor, you'd no food to eat. They're quite amazed at that, you see. Aye, gives them that ground. And I'm slightly amazed that your father was taken out of school at 13. Oh, aye, but that was quite standard. Aye, the past is a foreign country, eh? Oh, uh, yeah, yes, a foreign country. So, Sheena, on to your next poem, A Dug, A Dug. This is Ian Yatak around the schools, is it? Oh, the, the Burns love this. One, it's about pets. They've all got pets. The only place, there was one school I went into and Abdi had pets. Um, and one child had now got a pet and he put his hand up and he said, it was quite a poor area, and he said, I had got a pet, but I've got a da. <laughs> and there was stunned silence because a lot of them were pets in the head of us. <laughs> he says, I've got a da. Oh, you know. But A Dog, A Dog is, is a super poem because it's for Glasgow. It's for the central belt. And I think it's important to Ken that Scots have spoken uh, over. And even in the northeast, you will get Glaswegian children. Or It's, it's good for Burns to Ken that they have got the whole hog. That it's spread over the whole country in different ways. So that's the why I do a dog a dog. All right, let's hear it. Right. Oh, before we hear it, would you like to stand up, dear wee sugar? <laughs> no, is this something you do in schools and all? Oh, yes, stand up. Right, talk us through what's happening here. Well, what's oh, happening right. here is, especially amongst, the, you, you, you dig it off the, the secondary school, but in the primary, the retention span is near as it could be, mm -hmm. because they're not used to long sitting their attention has gone to short bites, see? And also it embeds your Scots into movement, Ken. Right, so we're embedding our Scots into movement. So get um, off, up your, off your dips. Off the dips. And I will ask my glamorous assistant here, and he's going to date. I'm going to ask him, first of all, just while I play this, to loop like a puddock. Are you ready? I can loop like a puddock, they bought. Are you right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll give you a wee rest, eh? Uh, cheers very much. Hope your breeks aren't as tight as mine at home, because that was uh, 
could have been made comfortable. <laughs> you should. You know, <laughs> but so that the whole idea of that is that yeah. getting up and dancing about, te, acting out the words, acting out the words, and it'll stick in their heads. Panic is the frog, and the loping is the <laughs> leaping. You see, so they've learned two words. There you go. Lipping like a puddock. So we're away to read new A Dug, A Dug, and it's by Billy Keys, and it was first in the Kissed, A Kissed anthology. Hey, Daddy, would you get us a dug? A big brunel station, or a wee white bug, or a skinny wee terrier, or a big fat coolie. Oh, Daddy, get us a dug. Well, yeah. What? And whilst Douglet beefing it dirties the flare and pees in the carpet and messes the stair, it's me and your mammy will be teen for a mug. I won't play, I'm not getting a dug. Oh, I bet, Daddy. They're getting them away down there at the RSPCA. You'll get one for nothing, so you will. Oh, Daddy. Get us a dug. Will you? Do you hear him? Only about dugs again. I think that Ian's got dugs in the brain. I ken what you'll get. A skite in the lug if I hear any mare about this bloomin' dog. Oh, Daddy, how wouldn't it be dear to keep and I'd mask it a basket for it to sleep and I'd tuck it for runs a while the hell. Oh, Daddy, get us a dog, will you? I don't think there's umdy like you. You could wheedle the twist to a flaming corkscrew, get doon off my neck. Gives Nina your hugs. All right, that's enough. I'll get you a dog. Oh, Daddy, a dog, a dog. It's lovely. <laughs> get his dog. That's a smashing reading. It's a lovely poem. So tell lovely. us, out of the whole, the whole world of Scots Burns literature, you've chosen that in. Tell us what you like so much about it. Well, it's fun. And it's very few Burns have not girned and held and wanted a pet of some description. Uh, it's all the pros and cons for pets and against pets and all the rest of it. So you can open it up to a broader discussion if you like. Mm -hmm. Again, if they're writing about animals, uh, Matthew Fitz got Scott's Hoos and he's got reams of uh, uh, words that they can use. So I mean, this, this isn't for teachers, this is for bairns. Oh, aye, for bairns. So don't be, be telling them about the Scots Oh, no, don't be telling them a Scots Hoose, no. But for the bairns, uh, they enjoy the fun out, I think so. Yeah. Aye. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's, 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 there's a really good energy, and you're saying that, Ken, that's, that voice, that strong Glasgow voice, that isn't your voice at all. Oh, no. So do you, how do you feel when you kind of step out of your northeast voice and into a southwest voice? Well, I used to teach in Easterhoos, mm -hmm. so I'm quite used to hearing, well, I needn't say I was there long, I passed through for <laughs> two terms, but it was long enough to pick up the twang. It's very infectious, the Glasgow twang. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're musical at all, it's something you find till you've got like your phone voice, and if you hear somebody on the end of the phone, they're speaking in a Glas Glaswegian accent, I didn't mean to do it, but I'm right in there. So if somebody's fair, even Ireland, I'm um, into an Irish accent. I can't help it, I drift. <laughs> I drift, I'm a drifter. Drifter with a shoe with your accent. Aye. So the next theme is another uh, Scots dialect piece. And this yes. theme is fair, the tune we're in the day, it's fair Dundee. It is fair Dundee. Um, now I'm going to apologise here to our Dundonians present. <laughs> uh, um, you think if I date a bit deeper, I might just manage there. So. About Aye, think about, Ken, you're doing it a wee bit of rock. This rocher, is a... Rocher. Aye. Apo apologies to Dundonians. It's by W.N. Herbert and it's called The Answer Machine. I am not here to tap your car. I may be F at the football. I may be M not here at all, but just a figment of your file. Conjured up once on a while. There's maybe tatties on the bylo, and maybe hen a wee bit greet our an ingin or my sweetheart, or I'm bleeding in the street with my head kicked in for being so deep. And maybe here but fast asleep, say so leave a message at the bleep. <laughs> no. No, that in is a wee bit of different to the other ends because there's no a story to it, there's no a narrative, Ken, there's this, this momentary insight. Yes, into the life of an answering machine. Into the life of an answering machine. Yes, or the person, yes. So what about that, Max, that stand out for you? Oh, I mean, well, one, it's funny. Two, um, 
two, there's other reasons why somebody wouldn't want to answer their phone in Dundee or out of Dundee. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, there's various reasons why people wouldn't answer the phone. And they can widen it out and, and, and into discussion and say, why would you, a bit like um, the Selkirk Grace, why would you not answer your phone? Aye, would there be specific aye. reasons you could come about that, you see? Different ways, eh? <laughs> so both the last two poems, the, A Dog A Dog and The Answering Machine, they're both uh, dialect, but they're also just really good fun. Yes. Is Ken, poetry, folk watching this, hey, might be thinking of poetry as like a wee bit highfalutin, maybe it's something you do with a beret on, but you, it, these are infused with fun and laughter. Is that any of the reasons you love poetry in general? Uh, no. Um, Burns like fun and laughter, that's all right. We'll give them lashings of that. They're not really all enough to take in the really dark stuff. <laughs> um, years ago, when I did a poetry, uh, well, it was, it was a reading, a sort of a reading, but there was a lot of other poets there. And one of them, I want to say his name, he said, are you a versifier or a poet? And I said, that's a strange thing to say. He says, well, we were thinking you, you had a fit in both camps, you see. And by versifier, he meant somebody that just could clamble, crumble, clink kind of style and just churn out the wee funnies. And poet would be the deep and meaningful and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it is good to ken that Scots can delve into the deep as well as the, the light and fluffy. They do. But uh, I don't ken if, if weans, I used to think that they are their lives are hunky dory. So maybe the, the very young, the light and fluffy is fine for them. And plus, they're only learning language, so they're nae, they're nae like my age now. I mean, if I hadn't learned language with my age, I'll never learn it. <laughs> but somebody a five-year-old is just picking up b bits of wordies of English, like Elaine Scots. So from they're very young, they're just learning language, and you don't want them to associate with something a little dark. Will you say that? We've had our two fun choices and renewing into something a wee bit deeper and a wee bit darker. So, Ken, settle yourself down for Mellow Tifty's Annie, your next choice. And then you're going to hate the sugar again, I'm telling you. Aye, I've got a sugar coming up. A sugar. Maybe After what? this, we'll sing as first. Mellow Tifty's Annie is a well known Northeast ballad and is based on a true story. It's used more in the secondary school, it's very popular in the Northeast. And it's based, so I would tell, usually I would tell them a story, so I'll tell you the story now. Um, and it's, we know it's versions, there's 46 verses. I'm needy in 46 verses. But basically the miller, uh, the miller of Fivey at Tifty, uh, he had a really bonny lassie called Annie, his daughter, and she fell in love with Lord Fivey's trumpeter. Now, the father wasn't pleased because he wanted her to marry the Lord. He didn't think a trumpeter was up to snuff, near with him being a wealthy miller. So he said to Lord Fivey to get rid of him, to put the trumpeter down to Edinburgh for a wee while to try and get Annie to take her heed out of that area altogether. Um, but she refused to give him up, and the father beat her, the mother beat her, and sad to say, the brother finished her off. He broke her back. It's quite grim, you see. And she lay down to die, facing Fivey. And of course, when the mother, the young trumpeter, come back, he died of a broken heart. Now she's buried. Public subscription raised money for her grave, and she's buried in Fivey Kirkyard. Uh, I went there with the storyteller. Stanley Robertson with a party of folk, and the day we went there, it was misty. There was a black cat sitting on top of her grave, and somebody put a reed rose on it, and <laughs> So here we go, poor Tifty. At the mellow Tifty lived a man in the neighbourhood of a heavy. And he had a lovely daughter fair, and they called her Bonnie Annie. No Lord Fivey had a trumpeter, whose name was Andrew Lamy, 
And he had the earth for to win the heart of the melot of days and age. New Lord, five we he rode by the door, to whom war left of days and age. And his trumpet I rode him before, even the same man me. New her mother cried her to the door, saying, Come here to me, Annie. Did ere you see a bonnier man than the trumpeter of Ivy? Oh, nothing she said but sigh and say, Twas a loss for bonny honey, For she durst nay in her heart was won By the trumpeter of Ivy. O oh, my love, I get it in but a tune, and for a while must leave ye. O oh, but I'll be dead afore ye come back in the green kirk year o five Knew her feather struck her wondrous ear, and also did her mother. But her sisters also took their score, but we be to her brother. Her brother struck her wondrous ear, we cruel strokes and money, and he broke her back o'er the temple stain. I the temple steen o five O mother dear, please mark my bed and lay my face to five for I will lie and I will die for my dear Andrew Lamy. No fan Andrew him fed but I came. We mock o grief and sorrow. O oh, my love, she died for me last night. So I lie and die tomorrow. So it's a song, a romantic song. So there's romance and then there's also family violence. So there's lots of issues to unpack there. But uh, secondary school children are, uh, you know, they're at the Romeo and Juliet age. So romantic things are very much to the forefront of the teenage mind. Mm -hmm. And also some of them would, might be well acquainted with things, themes like violence in the home. So certainly not for the primary school, but for older kids. Yes, I've, I've seen it made into plays in secondary schools. It lends itself to that. Um, and a lot of the old ballads are sung. So the poetry that used to be in the Northeast, a lot of it would be sung. Cuthbert Graham used to call it the, the singing land because so many poets sang as well as did poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, do you, why do you see the, uh, the place of these traditional ballads in modern Northeast? Are they still, Ken, can you still bring them out and are they still part of living tradition? Oh, I, I mean, they're, they're, this is why, I mean, Scots has never died out because um, it's being sung and spoken and for hundreds of years they've been saying Scots is dead. Well, it's, it's nothing like dead and there's been a major resurgence of it as well. Aye, no. But through the music as well as the poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I think the twagging hand in hand. I would say. It was a really powerful uh, performance and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, well, I was beaten. 46. 46. 46. Aye, no, I would have been sitting here with a full beard by the time you got to but, the end of it. No, but, but some of the travellers, it's the travellers that sung a lot to them. Aye. And kept them going. But to Fivey, the castle of Fivey is the most haunted castle in the northeast. 
Aye, so that thing is based just around Fivey Castle, which is this huge muckle pile, oh, a, muckle a million houses, a million rooms, and uh, all turrets and that. Like it's been, it's been on the most haunted lists in the Scottish TV and that sort. Aye, with that sort of stuff going on, I'm no surprised. I mean, oh yes, sir. Behind us a gate, no, no, no the public subscription raised their gravestone. And Peter Buchan, it says there, uh, actually himself, the North East poet, paid for 30,000 copies of the Malatifti's Annie to be distributed around the North East to keep it going. Amazing. Well, you find a lot of enthusiasm for um, Scots poetry. As, uh, some of it comes for the schools. A lot doesn't come for the schools because a lot of teachers are a bit of fear to use it. They feel if they're speaking Scots in front of kids, they'll lose face and they want to be, so, you know. And you also get folk that still, and it intensely irritates me, they can't slang. And that just wants me to trap with them. Aye, let's make that absolutely clear. Scots isn't a slang. No. 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 Are you getting to stand up and loup? <laughs> I think we're needing a wee loup as a sorbet. <laughs> to, to move us on from <laughs> <move you on, laughs> military days to Come something on. a wee bit lighter. Just now, a change. Abdi, Ahim, I'm not doing this with Todd, so up. No, you must get up. I must get up. What are we doing now? Right, this time you are going to be... Now, you can be a shelter or a cuddy. It's entirely up to yourself. Some folks say a cuddy is a donkey. Ah. Some folks say it's a horse. Uh, shelt or cuddy can be used as a horse. So I'll, I'll take I would a like a wee to horse, see you right? uh, like a shelter or a cuddy. Running. Are you ready? Well, galloper. Nibble. Uh, no, you're not going to do enough. What's no, a you, look like? You just gallop and look. No, Maybe. gallop. Are you ready? I'm yeah. ready. <laughs> very good. That's, that's not a very good cuddy. I hope yours were better than mine. It wasn't bad, it wasn't bad. Ah, oh, cheers very much. Sophie kind you. You're, I think you're being, you're being kind to me because you're kind of a wee bit embarrassed. <laughs> oh, I've taken a wee bit of a beamer for that, but... No, no with Les. No, with Les. <laughs> no, aye. So we're going to move on to, a, I think, your shortest rhyme oh, poem of the day. Do, yes. A bit of versifying. Somebody might cry it. Well, I wouldn't. No, but there you go. And so we're on to the Veggie Olympics. Key is the reading, and then we'll hear a blether about it. We'll hear a blether. I'm the just Veggie it. Olympics. It is short. Right. This is by Les Wheeler. Now, Les Wheeler was a secondary teacher at Northfield Academy, English. He was uh, seconded to be. Uh, he was seconded to be advisor for Scots for the region, and he was high up in the TMSA as well. And he wrote with me, I mean, it was part of my job, Elphinstone, was to promote Scots poetry. So I was writing a lot of poems for Burns that were simple. Four-liners, simple Scots about things that they would care about. Mm -hmm. And Les came in off his end, but he wasn't paid a halfpenny, nor a brass farthing, and he wrote a huge amount of really short poems for Burns that you tend to find in the Burns competitions they often recite Les and he's recited in a lot of the poetry competitions around the northeast so he, in fact I just went to school and was just a bit trampled in the rush to get his autograph <laughs> here we go please the veggies olympics runner beans are half a fit spruits are fine and swack preserves loup like kangaroos hurdling round the track Lang leeks, loup our sunny pits, carrots throw the hammer, Nelly neep she bides at him. I canna say I blame her. <laughs> no. Tell us how that in sits alongside your burns, your dug a dugs, your militifty's Annie. How come that in's in there? That's in there because it's really short. <laughs> It's like a taste in the mood. They say, taste the garlic in your mouth, you know? So you get a wee garlic phrase here or there. So you've got a wee, two very short verses of uh, Scots in your mouth. It's just to give you a taste. Mm. An amused bush. There Aye. you go. Just, you know, camp like. <laughs> so um, that's what we aim today. And a lot of teachers will use them because they're fine and simple in it. Um, it doesn't put up barriers between Burns and Scots. This is something I'm dead interested in because you do 
all sorts of work in schools, most of the time you hear your own grand wins. How do you negotiate that for, because Ken, you, your, your granny was a broad Doric speaker, yeah. your father was a broad Doric speaker, so it wasn't it difficult for you to kind of explore the lead further. Mm -hmm. For all them watching this that maybe Arnie, weren't they born in Scotland, maybe their family weren't they born in Scotland, Scots is it's a foreign foreign language to them. Oh. How do they get into it? How do you help them into it? Letting them ken it's for them as much as it's for us. Um, well, I think it's been proved over and over that bilingual bands, the bilingual bands, talk to different languages easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it's down to attitude because I had to do a. Uh, and an M lit into Doric. Mm -hmm. The, the inter -tran intergenerational transmission of Doric phonemes. <laughs> oh. A big move, but never mind. <laughs> I had to go around primary sevens, 117, and interview them uh, up this side. And what it boiled down to was if the grandparents spoke it and the bairns in attitude. So in a village, um, there was two Dutch brothers and a Dutch brother said he loved it. He used to follow folk in the village to hear uh, speak in Scots, and he wanted to speak Scots, but his brother was, he would rather speak Dutch, and he just lived for the holidays for they get back to Holland, and he didn't like it at all. Aye. Um, so somewhat, and you often find, that, um, especially nowadays, kids are, are not brought up with the parents, it's the grandparents because the parents are out working. They're either out working or sadly some of them have issues in their lives, which we want to get into. Aye. And the grandparents are bringing them up. So it tends to be dependent on the influence strongly at the caretaker that's bringing them up. But so for, for Burns that didn't have Scots speaking family, how, is, it, is school a good way into it now these days? Is, is there a way into Scots at school? Um, the reason school shift about in the back foot is they didn't want to kerfuffle them between English and Scots. It's because Scots is akin to English. It's like sib, but it's nay. Okay. <laughs> so I think they're worried that the, sp the spelling and all the rest of it, because there's eye issues for every gang in Scots with spelling. It doesn't arise when you speak it, because Abdi will hear their own idea of who it's spelt. But folk like Matthew Fitt, James Robertson, and folk bringing out anthologies like that try and overcome that. Folk like Billy Kay as well, and yourself, try and overcome that. And it's mostly done through the spoken word. They do, but a lot of it. Sheena, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for loping and nothing. That was an absolute mentor. I've never seen a better puddick in Amadeus. Oh, cheers very much. Yeah, I know. Yes. And cheers very much for watching.